Okay, now this is the last part I promised in the previous video for the Econ 2302 students. If you're in 2301, this formula does not apply to you. This is a more detailed formula for use in microeconomics. The concept is called price elasticity of demand. Capital E with the subscript of a capital of D is the description for that. So I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to go ahead and share the screen with y'all here, and we're going to take a look at what that exactly means. Is what we're waiting for here. So let's see. Screen share. And then let's share, and that's boom. Okay, so we're going to start talking about the math end of this stuff first here, and I like to use the powerpoints for this. And so let's get started by talking about price elasticity of demand. What it is. What are some properties of it? First of all, E sub D is our short symbol for what we call price elasticity of demand. And it measures what we call a relative consumer responsiveness to a change in price. E sub D, or price elasticity of demand, is not the same as slope. Slope is an absolute rate of change, whereas E sub D is a relative rate of change. Think of it this way. $5, okay, is a big percentage of $10. It's 50% of $10. But $5 is a very small percent of $50,000. It is 0.01% of $50,000. Similarly, one unit is 10% of 10 units. It's 0.01% of 10,000 units. The point here is this is relative rates of change. It's measuring relative sensitivity of a percentage change in quantity demanded to the percentage change in price. Please notice there's no deltas here. It's percent delta, percent change quantity demanded and percent change in price. Now there's two formulas that we talk about. This is a very general formula. It's sometimes called the point elasticity formula. But we typically are evaluating these things mathematically over a segment of the demand curve. And so we're gonna deal with what's called the midpoints formula. This is not the same as slope at all. It is a totally different animal, so don't confuse it with slope. That's one of the biggest mistakes micro students make is where they confuse the elasticity of demand coefficient, price elasticity of demand coefficient, with the slope. So the midpoints formula, and this is again assuming you have a table like these practice problems, like for micro students, homework one, problem two, where you have two rows in the table. And so Q2 minus Q1, quantity in the second row minus quantity in the first row divided by Q2 plus Q1, divided, probably multiplied by, excuse me, multiplied by P2 plus P1, divided by P2 minus P1. Now some of y'all might say, well, I saw a division symbol and all those additions were on the bottom and there's a divide by two. And yes, that's the proper averaged out midpoints formula, but what I have done here is mathematically simplified it to make it a little less confusing. So that way it's like you work these like subtract, adds. Add, subtract, simplify, 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 and reduce to a fraction as long as the top and the bottom are both less than 100. Or go to a decimal, rounded to the third decimal place if it doesn't stop at three, if you have a long stringy decimal, okay? But if this stuff gets reduced, and I mean mathematically reduced all the way to where top and bottom are less than 100, then you leave it as a fraction. And so for problem two on homework one, we're using the midpoints formula. We're going to go through an example of that now. I am going to go back to this Word document here where we were working on all this information here earlier for parts A, B, and C. And I want to call everybody's attention to the demand schedule because this is where the data is coming from for the E sub D coefficient. I'm also going to go back to the formula sheet that everybody was emailed. I'm going to copy this formula so we have something to start with. And again, I don't have a whiteboard. This is easier to read on a shared screen. And so just bear with me for a moment while I copy and paste this stuff into there. And that's not what I was trying to copy. <sighs> Boy. Okay, so again, just be patient with me for a moment here, students. And so let's see here. Copy. All right. And then let's see here. Control V paste. There we go. Okay. So we're going to start with this formula here. And what we're going to do is we're going to pull data from the demand schedule up top. Now remember, for these formulas, we don't put in the units and the dollars for the calculations because it's cumbersome. And actually, the units and the dollars will factor out when you're dealing with this equation because of the factor label rule. So we're going to start with the quantities. Q2 is 80 units. Q1 is 50 units. So 
Let's go on over here. Let's get our divided difference in there here. So we got 80 minus 50 up top, and then we got 80 plus 50 down below. Okay, so there's our first part of the whole thing. Now, let's grab a multiplication symbol, okay, and let's set up our next factors here. P2 plus P1 is 58 plus 73. P2 minus P1 is 58 minus 73. So let's get those plugged in there. 58 plus 73 divided by 58 minus 73. All right. Now, again, we need to take a couple of steps to simplify this, and that's exactly what you're doing. And we're going to just do this one step at a time. 80 minus 50 equals 30. 80 plus 50, that's equal to 130. Put the multiplication symbol in the R. And then next fraction here, we just find the right symbol here, excuse me. And then 58 plus 73 is 131. Oh, that is so close. And 58 minus 73 is negative 15. All right. Negative 15, not negative carrot 5. Okay. All right. Now, let's continue on here. We need to reduce each of these fractions one at a time. I'm going to hit enter. I'm going to tab. I'm going to actually continue this whole thing over here just because we're running out of space and so forth. I want to keep it nice and center of the stream. We're going to do this one fraction at a time. Now, 30 and 130 both divide by 10. So if I factor the 10 out of the top and the bottom, I get 3 over 13 students. Okay, then we're going to put our multiplication symbol in here again. And I don't like to use the cross X for that. I like to use the star just because we're supposed to be beyond basic arithmetic here. But whatever makes you all comfortable here, I say go ahead and use. Okay. And then our next fraction, 131 is a large prime number, so it does not reduce. I'm going to put the minus sign out front because that's a fraction, the whole fraction is negative. And then put the 15 downstairs. Now, if the 131 the 15 had common factors, we'd reduce them. Now, the next step is to factor diagonally. And again, because 131 and 13 are both prime numbers, they have no common factors, but 3 and 15 have a common factor, and that factor is 3, so we're going to go ahead and we're going to replace the 3 with a 1, and then we sell the 13 downstairs, okay, and then we put in our multiplication symbol next, and then our other fraction is going to now read negative in the front, 131, and then 15, and probably 5 down below. Remember, the 3 and the 15 factored down to 1 and 5. Now, at this point, since we can't factor anything more diagonally or top to bottom, we multiply across. So the minus sign goes up front. 1 times 131 is 131. 15, probably 13 times 5 is 65. Now, this would have been so wonderful. It would have been so very wonderful in the event that that had been 130, but unfortunately it's not. So what I'm doing now here is since the top and the bottom, the numerator and denominator are not both less than 100, you cannot have something that must be positive or zero decrease by more than 100%. That just cannot happen. So what we have to do is we have to reduce it to a decimal for the sake of making some sense here. And I need to change something. We're going to have a long stringy decimal here. This is not form a truncated decimal. So I'm going to be inserting this wavy equal sign here. This is what you would write it here to mean approximately equal to. And then this is a negative number. Let me talk about that in just a second here. The ease of D coefficient must be negative. It must be negative here. Now, I know a lot of the principal's textbooks say, well, you drop the minus sign, and the response that the economist says is, no, you do not. Okay? The reason why the ease of D coefficient is negative is because of something we learned about on the previous show, the law of demand. And the law of demand says that if price goes up, quantity demanded must go down, and vice versa. And dropping the negative sign is, at best, silly, and at worst, basically confusing to people. So negative 131 divided by, by 65 has this long string of a decimal. So we're going to take a look at the first three decimals and then also look at the fourth. Nothing matters after the fourth decimal place. We are rounding to the nearest third decimal place, which means we have to look at the fourth to know what to do. Rules for rounding. There is no round down. It's either round up or do not round up. It's kind of like what Yoda would say. Do or not do. There is no try. Okay. So the thing is, the third decimal place is five. The fourth decimal place is three. Because the fourth decimal place is less than five, we do not round this up to a six, we keep it a three. 
Now, had this been negative 2.0157, we would have rounded up to negative 2.016 for three decimal places. So let's make sure this is a 2.015, and that is the answer for E sub D. I want to stress again, we will only, I repeat, only go to decimals in the event you cannot reduce this. I say you, I mean mathematically it's not possible to reduce this as a fraction with numerator and denominator both less than 100. Okay. Now, of course, that's part of question D. It says calculate E sub D, but then the next question asks, is demand price elastic or is demand price inelastic? Well, we're going to go back to the slideshow for a moment. We're going to skip ahead here where it talks about these things. There's three ways we can talk about price elasticity of demand. The first way is if the E sub D coefficient is between negative infinity and negative one, demand is price elastic, which means quantity to demand it changes by a bigger percentage than price does for that segment of demand. That's another way of saying quantity demanded is highly responsive or sensitive to changes in price. Now, negative 2.015 is to the left of negative 1 and to the right of negative infinity, so that's going to fit over here. But if we had a value like, say, negative 4 thirds, that would still fall in here, but suppose it's been negative 3 fourths. Negative 3 fourths or negative 0 0.75 is between negative 1 and 0. It's to the right of negative 1, to the left of negative, to the left of, pardon me, 0, excuse me. So negative 3 fourths would mean demand would be price inelastic which would mean quantity demanded changes by the smaller percentage than the price does for that segment and is therefore not sensitive to price changes. It also mentions about E sub D being equal to negative one, but I'm gonna say something up front. You're not gonna see that in these math problems I assign you. Demand is gonna either be price elastic or price inelastic, and so therefore you don't worry about it being equal to negative one. In fact, for demand curves with a negative slope, there is one single point, and it's not the midpoint, where the E sub D is exactly negative one. But what's funny is to the left of that, you tend to have E sub D values where demand tends to be price elastic, or the values are between negative infinity and negative one, and to the right of it, towards the bottom of the demand curve, E sub D tends between negative one and zero, which means towards the bottom of the demand curve on the right-hand side, it tends to be price inelastic, and where that E sub D is exactly negative one is where the demand is shifting from being price elastic over to being price inelastic, or vice versa, depending on which way you're going. So I'm just gonna borrow this here again, just so I don't have to reinvent the wheel. And so I'm gonna go back to this Word document over here where we've been working, and that's not it. Here, hold on one second, we will find it. That is definitely not it. Okay, here we go. So I'm gonna go over here, since E sub D, which is equal to, excuse me just one second here. I'm just trying to get this thing right on the right level here, equals to negative 2.015. And let me take this thing away. There we go. Since E sub D, which is equal to negative 2.015, is to the right of negative infinity, but to the left of negative 1, demand is price elastic. Please do not say demand is elastic, because demand could be income elastic. Demand could be cross price elastic with respect to the price of a different product. You have to be specific. E sub D stands for price elasticity of demand, and so you have to use the word price elastic. It's technically one word that is formed by a hyphen. So the thing is, this here fulfills the last part of our answer, and we're now done with this example math problem. This is the same methodology that y'all would be using to solve the other practice problems for unit one, as well as for problem number two in the handwritten homework. Now, I want everybody to notice I've, I've given y'all two more practice problems that involve calculating slopes of demand, and interpreting, calculating equations that represent demand and supply, calculating equilibrium price and quantity, and calculating E sub D. It is highly recommended that students work all three of them. They're not for credit, but this is for the sake of learning this because problem two on the handwritten homework is for credit, and you want to make sure you do it correctly. So anything that helps you with that is a good idea. Now I'm going to go back to the camera here and kind of wrap this thing up. Students, I understand that this is not the same thing as being in class live. You can't stop me and ask questions in the middle of it. I'm going to try to see if I can do a live hangout at some point after class begins or preferably live office hours. But I would like you all to please take advantage of these videos and use them. 
because they're going to make it very easy. And if you're absent, especially if the flooding has kept you from getting to campus, or if you were having trouble understanding in class, you can go back through and review these videos. You can pause them. You can take a look at the progress of what's happened and so forth. And hopefully this will help enlighten your understanding. I hope everybody's doing well, and again, for Lone Star students, I'll see you this coming Tuesday. For HCC students, it's going to be after September the 11th, but I wish everybody good health. I wish everybody is well here, and please be looking for another video on shifting supply and demand in equilibrium for both micro and macro coming up by tomorrow. Thank you all very much.